The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast, episode number 36. Wow, we're at 36. We're... uh... We're, we're really coming into the next phase of this thing, aren't we? Yes, the, the next phase of the thing is is, is here, and uh, we have a fantastic show today. Dan Loutson is on the show tonight. You're, you got to be kidding me, Dan Loutson. Uh, I am not kidding you. He is fa- a fantastic cinematographer. You probably remember him for Shape of Water, but also maybe John Wick 2, or now out in theaters, John Wick 3. I don't see movies now because I have a baby. But uh, uh, one day I will I will see all of those movies. So uh, uh, why did you get so lucky to interview him and I did not? Uh, I, I guess that you were not in Poland at the time. I wasn't in Poland. And in fact, I, I believe I took about a year sabbatical of conducting interviews. So uh, all right. well, I'm thank you so much for filling in for me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to you getting back to these. Uh, I, I'm tired of, tired of having to, to pick up your slack. Okay, that, That's fair. <laughs> so let's get on with this interview. Uh, without further ado, here is Dan Loutson. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Dan Loutson, thank you so much for coming on the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you very much for taking me here. It's, it's an honor to be a part of this show here. So, so Dan, I think that, uh, I mean, you have a, a long career and you've collaborated with uh, Guillermo del Toro on, on multiple occasions, but I think maybe people know you best right now for uh, Shape of Water, which is um, a very exciting uh, project. And um, It is. And uh, got a lot of uh, awards and accolades and nominations and things. And That's so, right, yeah. So uh, I actually have a... Um, a way for people to ask questions uh, okay. of, our, of our guests. And okay. uh, I want to start off actually with uh, Kyle Roberts. He sent a question and he wanted to know about pre-production for Shape of Water and wanted to know if uh, how much maybe improvising happens on set and how much is uh, paint by numbers because you've figured out the whole plan long, long in advance. It seems like a like something which has a lot of pre-production. So. When we did Crimson Peak, one day Guillermo came to me and said, um, I have to, we have to do this movie. It's a movie I've been having in my head for many years. It's going to be like a girl that's falling in love with a creature, and I want to shoot it black and white. And I said, wow, this sounds fantastic, uh, because, you know, a girl that's falling in love with a creature is not weird, because it's Guillermo. He loves this. He's his world. So, you know, you're used to that, and he said, that sounds fantastic. And uh, black and white was a dream for me, as I think a lot, lot of cinematographers want to shoot a black and white movie. So I was very exciting about it. I thought like Orson Welles already. Or, and then we talked about that a little bit and it was just financing, it was difficult to do. So we, we slide away from that or he slide away from that. And then we went into color world and um, I think that was a really good choice because the color palette in the movie is fantastic. But about post-production, I think I have six or eight weeks. I think I have eight weeks of post. And of course, you know, Guillermo is doing this kind of moon boards for each set, so he, he has a guideline for me and the production designer and wardrobe, you know, the color palette. And then we are talking about color a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot. And we have a pretty straight plan. He have a very specific plan about how the movie should look. Not so much about the lighting, because, you know, we are very agree about that. We All the way back from Mimic, we did for like, feels like 100 years ago, but it's like, what is it, 20 years ago or something like that? Like 1993 or, or yeah. some, something like that, yeah. So, but I, I just remember my kids were pretty small. They're sitting in those chairs in the studio, you know, in the middle of the night and a lot of smoke and those two small kids are sitting there, like, <laughs> uh, long days. Um, so we're coming back. Our background is that, like, single source lighting, you know, deep shadows, um, powerful images. That's what we like. And we like to move the camera a lot. But what's special with... Shape of Water is all the shots is designed to each other. You know, it's not like we are shooting a master and then we are coming in for coverage as you do normally. So what he did or we did was all the shot is designed designed to cut together. So we are turning around all the time. It's not like we are block shooting, not shooting against the windows in the morning and then you're turning around in the afternoon. You're shooting as it's cutting. You know, you're shooting close up of you, going to me, close back to you. So it's a lot of going back and forwards. And of course, as a cinematographer, it's pretty complicated because you have to remember your lighting setups. Um, 
but when that is set, you know, it just works so fantastic well because you can see the camera is a third partner of the shoot of the, of the scenes because it's he's telling stories with the camera so precise. And I think that's the only way you can do it if you're doing it shot by shot. Everything is shot with one camera, you know, and no coverage. It's like it's designed as it's it looks like. I think that that sounds like a uh, a challenging way to work. Uh, it's a big, big challenge. It's very complicated because you know you have to remember your lighting setups, and that's not so easy. It's it's almost though sounds like you're kind of working in sequence in each scene though too. Then so you're starting with it's not master coverage, but you're going from shot A to shot B, shot C. You're, exactly. Yeah, um, that, and it's it works really well. It's just difficult to do it because it's time consuming. You have to take walls off because everything is made with. Dance floors, dollies, G bomb, and steady cam. So you know all, the, all as you maybe remember, the the, the camera is floating all the time. Mm, it definitely uh, is. Yeah. And of course, you can only get that feeling about floating if you're designing the shots and you know where you're going to cut. And he knows that. You know, he's editing all the time, and it's it's fantastic. I think he's so precise about that, and it works really well. How are you guys handling then from scene to scene? So if you, uh, you you know what the scene was preceding and you have an idea of what that shot is, if you're going cut to cut, uh, I know you didn't shoot the whole movie in sequence. Uh, I don't think did you did you so you didn't go scene one, scene two, scene three. No, he he will he preferred to do that, but there were some reasons we you know locations we couldn't do that. Uh, I think the first thing we shot was actually the loading dock. Hmm. I think a lot of directors want to shoot scene, scene number one first and then. But you know, there's a lot of lot of reason you cannot do that. But we did in scenes. You know, we did. We turned around and we shot the scenes in the way they should cut together. Uh, I remember Mimic really well. I saw Mimic in the theater actually, oh, yeah. and uh, Mimic um, M- Mimic actually taught me a, a very important lesson because when I when I left the movie, I felt like I hadn't seen half of it, and I was like, "Wow, that movie was so incredibly dark." Turns out, I hadn't seen half of it. That movie theater purposely turned down their projection bulbs yeah. so that you that uh, they would last longer. And when I saw the movie later and I really got to see your work and your okay. lighting, I was like, this is a totally different experience. And oh, thank you. So, uh, so no, it, it, and, it, and it looks wonderful. And it, it, it is a dark and moody movie, yeah. but it's not so dark and moody that you can't see what's going no, on. No, for sure. But uh, uh, yes, I, I had a conversation with that theater after that. And they were like, they basically admitted to it. They said, like, yeah, we, those bulbs yeah. are really expensive. We don't, <laughs> we don't turn them up all the way. But see, that was yeah. the deal in the old days. You know, I know, I yeah. know you're not allowed to talk about old, the old days, but it just seems like. <laughs> you can talk about the old days. No, yeah. no. <laughs> you're saying, you know, and that's the reason I have been, you know, we shot we shot Crimson Peak and Shape of Water Digital, we shot Alexa, we shot Master Primes, mm-hmm. and I like that, you know, that's very high quality equipment yeah, uh, Extremely high quality, yeah, yeah. The, the highest quality. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and I really like that you know, it's non-forgiving, you know if you making a mistake, you just see it right away mm-hmm. um, but yes, you, don't, you don't have any surprises mm. but in those days when we, for example, Mimic, you know you have this problem with labs, you know, there's a lot of you know, everybody seems to forgetting where, how painful it was now and then to fight with the labs because we shot on film. And you know, I'm not saying film is gone, and I think that still have a very good things. But you know, those days, I just remember this discussion with the labs about you know mistakes, and the lab was always pointing at you, like, and you're sitting there and <laughs> and with. Yeah, and there's so many variables that are outside of your control too, and it's like, yeah, when it finally got to the theater, I mean, uh, I I sat on the um the, the committee for uh, evaluating digital projectors when the the DCI standards were being set up. All the complaints that we had about digital, and which there there were there are many, they uh still were overwhelmingly better than the average theater experience in the United States at the multiplex with a with a link system where the same film was being shown on two screens at the same time and bulbs were not being full brightness so it's it's very difficult as a cinematographer to to it was very difficult to put your faith in that anyone would see what your original vision was by the time I got to to the the multiplex. I 100% agree and you know what I was doing when we shot on films you know when you have going to the premiere you change the lens and the projectors because the, the standard lenses were so bad you know you, there's no focus there was no sharpness so you're fighting on the set with the best focus pullers and the best lenses you can buy for money and then you're putting in the cinema and you know the lens is a piece of nothing uh, so i remember we changed that on the premieres and you know they put the old piece of glass in back later on it was just looks so bad you know it's it's uh but there's a funny story about that when we shot Mimic, because we have a big reshoot in Los Angeles, mm. and uh, we shot, that's the end of the movie where everything is exploding and firing, and um, 
we decided to shoot in a big warehouse, a big factory area. And we was pre-lighting that for a week or something like that. It was a huge, huge, huge place. And on Wednesday, we couldn't, we was not agree about, we, we was not disagree. We want to shoot, do we want to shoot with smoke or no smoke? Mm. So we said, let's shoot a test. So we shot a test Wednesday. We saw that Thursday and we decided to go with smoke. Mm. And we, everything looks fine. It was great. And we was like, so we shot Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And the studio didn't want us to open the lab because it was too expensive over the weekend. So we didn't saw dailies. So Monday morning, we went to the lab and saw dailies and it was pitch black. It was like pitch black. And of course I was, I get a heart attack. I thought, it, I, thought I couldn't breathe. I thought I should die. Oh, no. And oh, the no. supervisor from the lab came in and said, you know, what's wrong here? And said, you know, it's pitch black. We cannot see anything. And Guillermo was of course nervous and I was freaking out and everything was chaos. Um, and then the lab said, no, we don't understand that because we have been developing like two million feet of film today and you know, everything is fantastic. And it's just, I think you have un- underexposed. So, and you know, as a cinematographer and you said, underexposed, you just think you're going to die. And then the visual, the post-production supervisor come in mm-hmm. and said, guys, what is the problem here? And he said, this is underexposed, it's pitch black. But I couldn't, get, I'm not an on-sex post guy, on-sex mm-hmm. post guy. Everybody can make a mistake, but you know, making a mistake in three days is painful. Yeah, it's like oh, yeah. a nightmare. Oh yeah. So he said, I don't, I don't understand the problem because before you made the print, I took the negative and till it. <laughs> oh no! And then he said, you know, everything oh, no. looks great. <laughs> And of course, in the lab, was a little bit like, you know, hmm, mm, maybe yeah. something is not correct here. <laughs> So uh, what their print was bad. Their print was no, uh, no. What's happening they, they showed was you black leader. <laughs> they showed you <laughs> no. What's happening was they were doing the last alien in the same time, oh. and those guys were bleed past bypassing the dailies. Oh yeah. And you know when you're shooting beach ply, beach ply pass, you shooting very flat. That's right. And we shot very dark, you know, because we want to have the dark image. So they were they were printing you from the beach by Exactly. Oh and of God. course, you know, then the lab was, oh, by the way, you know, oh, we're sorry. Oh, we're sorry. Here, we'll run some more dailies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, nobody talked about my heart attack and I was going to die. So that's... <laughs> Uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a great oh, story. It's a nightmare story for us <laughs> yeah, cinematographer. It, it is. It, it's scary. Okay, so, yeah. hey, I want to talk about John Wick. Uh, yeah. I know you did John Wick 2. Yes. I know you just shot John Wick 3. Yeah, I just finished uh, for three, four days ago. Wow, okay. So uh, I'd love you to talk a little bit about the, the process of, like, uh, coming back for a sequel and, you know, either matching a look or creating a new look or if there's a, an evolution of, of the look that's there. And uh, I know you probably can't say very much about John Wick 3 uh, story-wise, but maybe you can talk a little technically-wise uh, yeah. about it. So. When Chet, the director, asked mm-hmm. me to come to New York to talk about maybe shooting number two, uh, I saw number one, and the reason he called me was because he had seen Crimson Peak. He likes this very dark movie and he likes this strong colors as we did in Crimson Peak. Mm. And it's funny about Crimson Peak because it, pe- it feels like a movie everybody have forgot, but I think it's fantastic. I just love that movie and I think it looks fantastic, but nobody, it, get, it, got, it didn't get any attention. It's really weird. That's the way it is. But he asked me to come over and talked about shooting John Wick number two. And those guys have done a really good job on number one but they want to change it. He wants to go more classic. And uh, they have shot with some older anamorphic lenses. And they have shot anamorphic when they were shooting indoors, and when they were shooting outdoors, they've shot spherical. And that's an interesting choice. Yeah, uh, mm. but I was not a fan of that. I mm. want to shoot anamorphic all the way through. And I just love Master Primes normally. You know, I think that's really, really good lenses. So I um, want to go Master Anamorphic. But we still want to have some lens flare there, mm-hmm. and we, you, those lenses are not flaring at all because it's so good. So what CSCs in New York did behind the Alexa camera, you can have this filter. Mm. So what we did, they put some put some fishing lines in mm-hmm. behind the lens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we got this highlights flare, and that was like the first look we want to go with, like because Chad was for him it was very important to get flares. And for me, it was very important to get as clean lenses as we could get, but still flaring. So CS, CSC New York helped me with that, and that was really great. Um, and then we want to go more contrast and lighting and more colorful compared to the first one. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I think that works, you know, works pretty well. And, and Chad wants to shoot much more classic, much more like wide shots, uh, less, less close-up craziness. Um, so we did that. Uh, and John Wick is always a little bit crazy, long, long hours. But it's for Keanu is fantastic to be together with. He's so good to his stunts, uh, and that's the reason we can shoot wider because his his performance is like amazing. So we did that in New York, and New York is always like a dream to shoot in, and the cinematographer is a little bit difficult, but it's, it's my favorite city in the world. It, it's got, everywhere you look, you've got a beautiful angle in yeah. New York. No, it's, it's like fantastic, you, you, yeah. You've got great backdrops. But it's funny because it's a very dark city. Oh, yeah. If you're yeah. not in the main yeah. streets, as soon as you're- in Square. Yeah, it's, it's like just <laughs> getting very dark. So you know, a lot of lighting, uh, but I have a really good crew there. So, and, so, uh, so when you come to John Wick Three, yeah, uh, jo- evolution of look at all. Have you tried to keep the look similar? No, we try to keep the look better. Mm. You know, s- same deep black, mm. uh, very colorful, very mm. strong colors. So we just want to try to. Mm, it's always when you do number three, you know, you have to do it better than number two because that's the reason to <laughs> you do to, number two, three. Got to uh, do yourself exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think. So how do you, how do you raise the game from the cinematographer's perspective? Do you uh, do more camera motion? I know you you like to keep it play wide, and yeah. Keanu's fantastic for his choreography and, and all of that. Exactly. Thing. But uh, but yeah, how how it, as it, no, it's it's up to you to raise the stakes too visually to yeah. try to add some new element. No, we we have a big discussion, Chad and me, about how are we going to do this more organic. And the beginning was, in the beginning we have to start shooting in March, I think. Mm. And you know, New York in March is great because it's cold and rough and you know, it could be pretty rough. But then, I don't re- remember the reason, we, we the shooting slide a little bit more forward. So I think we start to shoot in May. And we said, how? Ca- what can we do to make this more organic? We need to put something in. And I was coming from Saber Water, where we were raining like crazy every, thing, every time outdoors, you know, and it's giving this three dimension to the look. So we said, let's rain. Let's have rain in New York every, every time we're outside. And everybody said to, you, to us, you know, we are crazy because New York and rain is so complicated. It was pretty complicated, but we did it. So more or less all the shots outdoors is happening rain in night. So everything is night, night, night. So we have like a lot of night shoots. I don't think we have one single daytime maybe one day in the whole movie in New York. Uh, so that was like our go to like rain, 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 very dramatic uh, and everything is nice. And it's, it's, I'm pr- it's tough to do it, but it looks pretty cool. Yeah, any anytime you're having to, to add water or rain, you're adding yeah. complexity. Exactly. But oh, does it catch light and reflect off the concrete and everything yeah. else? No, it's, it's, it's so it's, it's, that's what we did. We we add rain, and it's going to be. Uh, I think that's going to be oh, fantastic. Look fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I'm 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 very I'm very excited. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. So, uh, Dan, we're we're just about out of time. I, okay. I really want to thank you for being on the show. No problem at all. Fantastic to be here. Before uh, we go, uh, where can people find you? Well, if. I'm on Instagram. I'm a big fan of Instagram. I think it's super funny. Uh, yeah. And they can find me on Dan on Instagram. And uh, yeah, I think it's Instagram is a good way to show your pictures and tell where you are. And uh, it's for fun. You know, I, I love, I changed, you know, my background is still photography mm. when I was a young kid. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the film school and, you know, uh, actually I actually have to tell a story about that. Please. Um, I'm educated as a still photography. Mm-hmm. And I was like very young when I was done with that. And that's actually changed my life. But I have a big sister, Aneta is her name. And she, um, you know, she's a real big sister. She's one of those girls, you know, you better do what big sister's telling you because she knows better. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, she's right. So um, I came out of that still photography school and I want to be a national, national geographic photography. And I was like 21 or 20 and, you know, really difficult when you're coming from a small country like Denmark to break that ice. So she said, um, I saw an advertising for the Danish film school in in newspapers. You should try to look at that and say, sister, I'm not, I don't know anything about cinematography. I'm a still photographer. I want to do that. That's what I love. She said, don't be like that. Just go, just do it. All right. So I applied to the school and my brother-in-law was helping me to make the appointment. And I've put some pictures in and I said, you know, I'm never getting in, even, not even to interview because it's a high end school. And, you know, everybody that wants to go to that school is people that have been dreaming about being cinematographers since they could walk. 
and that was not my case. So I went to the interview and they liked my pictures and we have a long discussions about who is your heroes. And But I didn't knew anybody. So I, first of all, I don't think it's important to have heroes. I think it's nice or very important you find your own style in life and um, follow your heart. So I said, guys, I don't have any heroes. I just think lighting is very important for me. It was like when those days as well and this is now. Um, Say, so, okay, thank you very much. You can, we're going to get in touch for you. And I went to my sister and said, why did you put me in this situation? Because I feel so stupid when I was sitting there because I didn't knew anything about movie making. And she said, well, well, let's see what's happening. And a month later, they got a letter, you know, welcome to the Danish film school. And of course, the first year, I was a black sheep there because I didn't knew anything. You know, if you have to make a pan, I've never looked into the film camera my whole life. And I was together with those people that have been dreaming about being cinematographers all the whole life. Um, but that was like a last so thank you, sister. <laughs> Dan, th- thanks again for being on the show. No, it's, thank it's, you very much. It's, it's, it's really been great. Yeah, thank you. And you can follow me on Instagram if you like. I, I will. I, I think I already do, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Uh, maybe next time I'll interview you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Hey, uh, Ben. <laughs> I'm just jealous. <laughs> you are jealous. You're I'm always super, super jealous. Uh, it's time to pay the bills. Your favorite time. My, f- I love paying bills. All right. So uh, we want to talk about our wonderful sponsor and partner, Aerie. Aerie has uh, some amazing new lenses that uh, you can't buy. It's They're like all- it's like you kind of go, what else could Aerie ever do with lenses? Well, they they decided to make some cool, specially personalizable lenses, uh, which are customizable for full frame cameras. They're inspired by the creative co- collaborations they've had with top cinematographers. And uh, these are only available exclusively through Airy Rental and can be tuned to suit individual artistic preferences. Tuned so, meaning what? Uh, okay, so you can change the iris to create more of a circular bokeh, which is uh, defining the, the out-of-focus areas of a lens. That's a very big deal for cinematographers who want to try to put their stamp or something yeah. more, more unique. Can you make a bokeh that has, like, hearts or skulls or something? Well, you c- <laughs> No, no, that's that's not that's not an option for for for. Uh, Sorry, Ari, I just kind of got off on a y- little. Y- you did you, okay. So while it's possible that you could create that with any lens, that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, customizable. But very similar to the lenses that were designed as rental only for Ari's rental only Alexa 65 camera system. These are designed for the LF and the Mini LF. So uh, they give you. They give you a lot of cool characteristics and they have some uh, tunability. And uh, if you are interested in high end rental lenses and I am and as you should be and are interested in large format cameras, it is worth taking a look at these. There are some wonderful photos on the uh, airy rental group dot com forward slash DNA dash LF dash lens dash series forward slash index dot HTML that shows you how cool these lenses are. And uh, yeah, that just rolls off the tongue. Man, I love how you read that URL <laughs> like that was real copy. That's amazing. Well, you know, I, 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 I this is take 803. So <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, lenses are really cool. They've got some great comment and feedbacks from some of the DPs uh, on here, including uh, someone who's going to be on one of our upcoming episodes soon, John Gulasarian. And uh, yeah, I think he really likes he really likes him. There's a nice testimony her from him oh that's pretty sweet is, is it a picture of him smiling there is a picture of him smiling so he, he uh, likes to smile in photos unlike a lot of dps yes and and uh, and i'm really glad for it because if you look through <laughs> our website we got about like it's tw- pretty it's 28 a, serious looking dps it looks like a murderer's row of actual murderers and then like six that are smiling i'm looking so. at you papper <laughs> actually papper's papper's not uh, okay he's, you're looking at papper he, he, okay. yeah <laughs> All right. So, so Ben, uh, what's your, your short end this week? Okay. So my short end, uh, it, it's a little bit of a walk, but, but go with me. One of the best new TV series that I've found on television is uh, Chernobyl. Have you been watching Chernobyl? Absolutely. It's fantastic. It's like the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in its edge of my seat stuff. And, and frankly, last week's episode uh, should have come with a trigger warning about uh, dog lovers because oh. I am one because, man, they are not good to the dogs. In yeah, that that's and, and based on uh, all, all true stories. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all it's all based on true stories. So it was created by a, a guy named Craig Mazin, who uh, some of our listeners, if they listen to the Script Notes podcast, which is all about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters it is co-hosted by craig mason he's been talking about chernobyl for probably over a year on that podcast 
Uh, that is a great podcast worth listening to. But what I am hooked on is Chernobyl has its own podcast where hmm. after each episode, Peter Sagal of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me fame interviews Craig Mazin about that episode and kind of goes into the real life stories about the Chernobyl disaster that led to how he wrote that episode and how he made the choices he did. And it sometimes is shocking how like some detail that you're like, that's too crazy to have happened. Actually, the true story is way nuttier than what he was even able to do in television. By the way, I should say, I, I'm I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce the, the gentleman's name, but Chernobyl beautifully photographed by Jacob Ear, R I H R E. Don't know how to pronounce your name, Jacob, but uh, keep up the amazing work. That is an amazing, amazing looking show. And, and if you're listening to this podcast and you would like to come talk about the show, <laughs> we will be happy to have you on here and you can uh, you can berate me for mispronouncing your name. Um, I can't wait for that. It'll be great. Somebody should need I need to be berated by somebody on this podcast. So anyway, I just think that especially given that Chernobyl is based on a on a real, true, horrible real world event, having this sidecar podcast that uh, Craig Mazin is doing with Peter Sagal is uh, it's deepening the experience for me. And it's actually making me watch episodes more than once, which is hard to do with a baby but I'm managing. Wow. That, that is the very definition of transmedia, actually, as they say, a, a term that, that I've never particularly cared for, but transmedia, uh, the media about the other media that promotes the media is exactly what you're experiencing right now with your podcast supporting your, your love of the show. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, and I probably shouldn't fess up to this, but they drop the podcast before the show. And sometimes I'll listen to the podcast before Ooh, the show. Sacrilege. Which, which is like, yeah, it's, it's filling me with spoilers. But uh, honestly, unless it's something like the usual suspects or something, I don't really tend to care about spoilers because it's like, oh, in Chernobyl, in Chernobyl are they going to spoil that the nuclear reactor blew up? I already knew that part. Like, you know, yeah. you can't spoil Titanic. Yeah. We all know how it's going to end. I'm pretty sure that there's some encyclopedias up. Uh, Printed after 1986, which also has all of the information that's going to be covered. In yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's more to me, Chernobyl is like the journey that uh, that they're taking and kind of telling the story. And the acting is top notch. Craig Mason's writing is top notch. The directing is top notch. It's just uh, it, it's one of my favorite things HBO's done in a long time. And, uh, you know, I'm even including things like Barry in that, which obviously was already one of my short ends. I love Barry. Anyway, Ilya, what is your short end? Ooh, ooh, okay. So my short end this week is the intersection of two different things that is going to, I believe, have a, a larger and larger impact o over time. And that is, of course, Hollywood and Washington, D.C. Uh, there's a lot of controversy well, they, right they now. They always say Washington, D.C. is just Hollywood for ugly people. So uh, they, 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 do, they do say that, but I will tell you that um, it's not just for ugly people. That's not, that's not really? just, yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, our current. Is, uh, is Newt Gingrich better looking than I think? Maybe compared to Bob Dole. Mm. Mm, we'll have to. Mm, sorry, yeah. Sorry, 90s, yeah, we're, we're going down a path. Nineties political so, flashback. Go on, okay, go on, Ellie. So, um, everyone knows about our current president, formerly a reality television star Donald Trump. Uh, of course, he's probably the most obvious example, but maybe most people don't know that uh, Malia Obama has been interning in Hollywood for uh, a period of time, including for the Weinstein Company. And uh, I've heard from other people that uh, she gets various jobs in the industry now. Uh, a so friend of mine, actually, who's an editor, uh, he she was interning on the show that he was editing on a couple of years ago. Hey, I just have to give mad cred to then uh, Malia for wanting to start at the bottom as an intern and work mm -hmm. her way up because that's not how it works for everyone who uh, decides they want to get into the entertainment industry and maybe they come from wealthy or powerful or connected families or both in uh, case, or, yeah. or, or all, yeah or all of the above so uh but I'm, I've always been really impressed by that. But some people really do want to know the whole process. They want to learn it from the ground up. And uh, that's that's awesome that she she's doing it. But uh, I also just happened to uh, catch today on Bloomberg that uh, Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton are forming a production company that just uh, was hmm. was published today. And aren't uh, the Obamas also forming a production company or they have a deal with Netflix? That's what it is. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly it. And and it's interesting because some uh, some different streaming organizations, uh, entities out there are actually looking for political figures to sort of form these sort of partnerships and things with. And of course, just like this is personal, the uh, documentary from Sundance, which we talked about in our in one of our Sundance episodes, there has been sort of a 
documentary reality sort of component between politics and Hollywood for a long time. But it's mm-hmm. interesting to me now that well, there's like a documentary on HBO. I keep seeing about Beto O'Rourke running for Senate in Texas. That, that That's right. And uh, you spoiler alert, he loses. Well, uh, this this is not going away. The the political drama, the fictionalized drama of politics and, and everything in between. We will see more. I think we might see more politicians coming out of Hollywood. We might see more uh, political figures moving into Hollywood. Well, I mean, I think we've always seen politicians coming out of Hollywood. I mean, obviously. Oh, like you're going to go back Sonny to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan yeah. yeah, I mean, sure. But I always felt like they were very much outliers. Jesse, the body Ventura. Well, you know, uh, they, he he is very very much an outlier and an independent, and uh, ended up becoming governor of Minnesota, wasn't it? Correct. So, yeah, uh, I always feel like when these would happen, it would happen. Fred Gandy, the guy who, who played Gopher on the Love Boat, wasn't he a congressman or a senator as well? Oh, you got me there. I never watched the Love Boat, so I was never on. What? Yeah, I know. Right. Okay, so so uh, but anyway, what used to be sort of like an outlier, sort of like one of thing, or like occasionally it would happen uh, between the Obamas, the the Clintons, and the Trumps. Now all in short order, forming these companies and making deals. I I think that might just be one of those things that whoever becomes president, before you know it, there's a documentary about them. There's a. Fiction. I just yeah. I just. Uh, Without getting political in here, and you, nobody needs to dig very hard to uh, find, figure out my politics, but uh, I just look forward to politics being boring again and not being uh, entertainment worthy. That's my my wish for myself and everyone. I want politics to get so boring that none of these people want to have a production company. Well, I will tell you, it's uh, you're not going to be able to get away from that because Netflix is taking a stand against uh, the the, re- the recent political referendums oh, in in the South. It's and- not just Netflix. And uh, uh, Disney uh, said that they were going to uh, pull out production, and it's like if Disney's pulling out of Georgia, that's <laughs> all of the Marvel movies, which yeah, they've been shooting that's... all of them in Atlanta for years. So, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I mean, uh, I didn't think that uh, I didn't think that Georgia was going to screw up, screw up this cash cow, but but maybe they are. I I don't know. I mean, I guess it's pumping money into Georgia, but it's also keeping professional people employed in Georgia. And I don't really know that the state of Georgia is being punished that much if Marvel stops making movies there. Mm, I, I don't know. That, that's a lot of income and economy and jobs and everything else but, I, but regardless the the intersection of entertainment and politics it seems like has never been stronger and totally. uh, and i can't wait to see who is going to be next maybe uh <laughs> well bob bob dole did a uh, hawk viagra for a few years. god that's right i'd forgotten about that so yeah yeah rick, rick perry was on dancing with the stars <laughs> now he's the secretary of energy was the governor of texas yeah uh it's it's like the um the the television uh that maybe carl rove will get a variety hour it'd be like the turd blossom happy fun time hour <laughs> uh I, I was pretty pretty sure that you were going to go with like scooter libby but uh, but uh, but kudos to you <laughs> <laughs> i yeah uh anyway so, so on that lovely dark uh and twisted uh political note I, ironically chernobyl being the cheerier of the <laughs> chernobyl two. being the 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 yes the the history of of the the uh before Fukushima, worst atomic energy accident in the history of the world. So. Well, and as we record this, the uh, the season finale is next week, where supposedly we find out what caused the Chernobyl meltdown, and that I think is going to be a comedy of tragedies. Oof. Anyway, yeah. yes. So on all <laughs> on of that, these happy notes. Oh God, this is the most downer cinematography podcast episode ever. Ever, ever. Well, well that's, that's can, what happens can, when I don't. Can we can we bring up like genocide next? Can we get like you know? <laughs> well, you know the what was going to be my short end. Anyway, um, <laughs> skip that. You, you got uh, the bullet, listeners. So uh, on that note, though. Uh, hey Ben Rock, where can people find you? <laughs> uh, people can find me on Twitter at Neptune Salad. On uh, I, I'm, I'm at Neptune Salad everywhere except for Instagram, where I didn't really think it was going to catch on. So I'm Benjamin underscore Rock. Lamest choice of my whole life. Do you actually use Twitter? Are you a Twitterer? Oh my God, do I use Twitter? Oh wow! Okay. Holy crap! I, I, I guess. Holy I, crap! On a stick, do I use Twitter? Oh, okay. Do I'm you, gonna just right now. I'm gonna see how many tweets I I have made in my lifetime, and you're gonna be like, "Holy shit, you're quite the, t- the Twitter I, I user." I don't care about how many you've done in your lifetime. How many have you done like this month? Uh, several per day, probably. Wow. Okay. You're you're, you're if, one of the you're one of you, those. If you include retweets, yeah. Oh no, no, I don't. Uh, you don't. <laughs> I don't include this. <laughs> Is that not an original thought from you? Anyone can retweet. Anyone can hit that button and bloop. Uh, I have tweeted 21.6 thousand times. Holy shit. Since <laughs> oh I, my God. <laughs> I, I started in like 2009. So 
Uh, okay. So, well, <laughs> so the easiest place to interface with me would be Twitter, but I also, I am on uh, Facebook and, uh, you know, even, even the LinkedIn hit me up on the LinkedIn. Oh, you know what? And, and our producer, Alana Cody, thank you very much. Alana Cody, uh, is going to get on our, our case big time. Cause we didn't tell anyone to like the show, subscribe, write a review, but, but you and, just did. Oh, uh, well, I mean, we didn't do it at the beginning of the show and oh. who knows how many people are still listening at this and point. They're like, what do I do? I don't care. I, uh, what do I do? I listen I, to the I, show. Should I actually subscribe? Should, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not loath to admit this. I'm proud to admit this. That recently I was like, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I should go on iTunes and like the ones that I love, give them five stars and give them a review. And I did it because not not because I get anything out of it, but because it helps them. And I love the content these people are creating. So if you feel that way about us, you can do that for us. I'm going to take you to task too, Ben, because like I see you promote a lot of other podcasts, but I don't see you promote our podcast Wait, what are you saying i haven't seen like i i haven't been following you on twitter but something tells me well, that you this... should follow me on twitter okay well i'll follow you on twitter but on your other places i don't well, see I, you saying I, like I just, oh there's a new episode of the cinematography podcast I, I i i don't go overboard with that all the time but i will say this Ever. like I, I never fine <laughs> fine <laughs> okay so uh so twist some more arms promote the show uh subscribe like let's thank case let's thank Wait, alana nobody, let's... Nobody, nobody ever found out where they could find you Ilya. this is the messiest wrap up we've ever done in the history <laughs> this is of the it. best wrap up dude i think that at this point okay at this point maybe no one knows where to find me but you can find me at hot rod cameras and on all of the social medias at an at hot rod cameras sort of type of thing or at Ilya Friedman. That's where you find me. Do it. So uh, so then going back to what you were just saying, we would like to thank Alana Cody for her awesome producing. Thank you. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Kay's Alatrachi for 100 percent of the music that you've heard in this and every episode of the podcast. You can find him at Music by Kay's. Uh, excuse me. www.musicbykays.com. Go there. Leave him a comment. For God's sakes, tell him that you heard the cinematography podcast and you think he did good work. The guy needs his ego stroke, really, is what it comes down to. Constant. Oh, but man, have you seen some of his VFX stuff lately? Kay's is just the ultimate multi-hyphenate, and I'm jealous as hell. He doesn't need anybody else. He can make his own movies, and he can score them. He can do all the VFX. I, he, he made a music video recently where he shot the whole thing green screen on his back porch and wow. then did everything else in, I, I want to say, Houdini or some high-end vfx program that i that i wouldn't even know how to open much less use and he did this just amazing like, music video like all out of his brain just an amazing guy but still go to his website tell him you think he's awesome yeah or, or stinky one or the other just just, just <laughs> something. <laughs> something 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 uh, it just cut him because it because that's how he remembers how to feel <laughs> so uh and uh who, do we know who's editing this episode let's let's just thank our entire editorial staff of abby corbett and ben katz thank you very much team thank you both so much for putting up with our messy messy host wraps and uh you know you can always go visit the uh official website which is camnoir.com and, and uh that's all i got Thank you so much for uh, listening to this episode and we'll see you on the next one. This has been the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.